Good evening, church family. It is great to be here and great to see everyone out. Uh, Lee was having to, I've not been here in two weeks, and so he was having to adjust the camera for ugliness. And so uh, I'm focused in. Uh, it's great to be here. So, so very thankful to be able to be back and fellowship and uh, associate with, with God's people. And we are going to get started in our Bible class in our study of the Minor Prophets. We'll have a word of prayer before we do get started in our Bible class. And uh, I'm going to ask Brother Josh if he would to come and, and lead us in a prayer. Let's pray together. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for all the many blessings that you pour out upon us daily, Father. We're thankful to have David back. I'm thankful for the oversight here at Lafette and the work that the elders do. We ask that you watch over some blessings. We pray that all that's said tonight is pleasing in your sight, that we might gain much from it and add it, add it to our daily walk of life. Father, we pray that you'd be with all those that are sick and those that are having struggles. We ask that you be with those of Ukraine and pray that all that can end well and that you'd be glorified in that situation. We ask that you forgive us of our sins and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Appreciate so very much that prayer. Uh, we are involved in a study of the minor prophets. And as you know, what we have looked at thus far is we have looked at two of the minor prophets. Of course, the 12 that we are looking at, what we're doing is we're looking at them not from necessarily a, a biblical order that you and I see, but we're looking at them from a chronological order. And we have looked at Obadiah and Joel. And then we're going to take our time tonight to look at the prophet Jonah. Now, if, if there is a prophet of the 12, a minor prophet of the 12 that you and I probably recognize the most about or we probably have a greater understanding of we remember more about it i would be willing to say it's the book of jonah wouldn't you agree now i want you to be honest what is the one thing about the book of jonah that stands out that has caused you to remember this book even from a very little child what, what is it it's the story of the great fish or the whale, whatever you want to call it. And you know in that story that the Bible teaches us that Jonah is swallowed by a whale. He stays in the belly of that great fish, whatever it may have been, for a period of three days. And then the Lord speaks to the fish and he spits him out on the shore and he goes in the city of Nineveh and he preaches. That is a story that I remember before I understood stories. I mean, it was one of those stories that I can remember going back into my childhood and remembering my childhood Bible class teacher at the Verona Church of Christ. I can still see her today. Her name was Rivers Wilson. And she was a just a wonderful Bible class teacher. And I can remember her teaching me this great story. Now that is what stands out to us when we think of the book of Jonah. But brothers and sisters, I want to suggest to you that the book of Jonah is far more important than a story about a man who gets swallowed by a fish. If there has ever been a book that expresses unto you and I the greatness of God, the mercy of God, the wonderful love and the forgiving nature of God, I believe you and I are going to see it here in the book of Jonah. And so that's what we're going to do in our study is we're going to examine the book of Jonah and we're going to examine it in, in the same manner that we're looking at the other books of the prophets. But there are a few more things that I want us to look at because this is such an interesting book. There are seven, seven different points that I want us to cover. We're not going to cover them all tonight. It's probably going to take us at least two weeks because I want us to look through this three-chapter book or this four-chapter book 
that is recognized as the book of Jonah. But as you and I read and study this book, I want us to take the time to look at the author of the book. I want us to look at the authenticity of the book. I want us to look at the recipients of the book. Who was it written to? Who was it for? I want us to recognize the date or try to get an approximate date of the book. I want us to look at its purpose. I want us to look at some unique things that you're going to find in the book of Jonah, which is a prophetic book, but it's not like the other books of prophecy. There there are just some unique details in it. And I thought it would be good that we take the time to look at them. And then finally, we're going to look at lessons. There are four lessons that we're going to look at because there are four chapters. And we're going to look at one lesson from each chapter as we think about this book. Now, when you think about the author, let's begin first of all by recognizing that he is none other than recognized as Jonah. Some have suggested that someone other, or some have suggested someone other than Jonah wrote the book. The book was about Jonah and his prophecy to those at Nineveh, but some have suggested that he is not the writer. I would believe that he is the writer, just like all of the other prophets. Even though they write about events that took place in their life, it seems as if God inspired them to write these events. And so when you look at verse 1 of chapter 1, the Bible plainly says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying... And so there is the word Jonah. Now, when you think about the word Jonah, we've been looking at the different names or the meanings of these names. The reason that there is a portrait or a picture of a dove is because of the very fact that Jonah's name literally means dove. If you look it up, you're going to see the definition of dove. And so his name means dove. Now, there are a few things that I think we can learn about Jonah that we've not been able to see about the other two minor prophets that we've looked at. If you remember the previous two that we've looked at, Joel and Obadiah, the only thing that you know about them really is what the book itself tells us about them. But when we think about Jonah, there's a few more details spoken concerning Jonah that you and I can, can glean from as we think about him. One of the very first things that I want us to recognize is I want us to see his Lord within the context of this book. And you see his Lord in, verse, in chapter 1, if you'll note, in verse 9. Note, if you will, in chapter 1, I hope you can have your Bibles open to the book of Jonah. Chapter 1 and verse 9, the Bible says, So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, I fear who? The Lord, but not just any Lord. Note, if you will, it is Lord, the God of who? The God of heaven. And then he adds to it, this God, the God of heaven, the Lord God of heaven, who is he? What had he done? He's the creator of all things. Of course, here in the context of the Scripture, it says he made the sea and the dry land. But brothers and sisters, that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. Now, when you think about the Lord being his Lord, this is not just any Lord. Note, if you will, that in the context of your scripture, that word Lord should be capitalized all four letters, is it? In the context of your your passage there, you've got capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. I've told you this before and I'm going to keep on telling you because it's something that is important for us to understand. When you see that word Lord in all capital letters, That is referring to the proper name that should be given to God. You and I recognize it as Jehovah, or as the translation from the Hebrew language would be, Yehovah. They didn't have J's in the Hebrew language, and so they would would pronounce it with a Y, Yehovah. But this word is found some 5,519 times in the Old Testament, signifying the fact that this was the existing one. The only God of heaven, there was no other. In fact, if we were to back up, you could see that these people who are on this ship that Jonah is on, they were individuals who were crying out to their God. 
but none of those individuals were calling out to the Lord God. But the Lord God was the Lord of Jonah. And that's a good point for you and me. Is He our Lord? Is that the one who is the ruler of our lives? This is the one who is the ruler of Jonah's life. So we know, first of all, His Lord. In the second place, we can learn about His lineage. Note, if you will, back in verse 1 of uh, chapter 1, the Bible says that it is Jonah, the son of Amittai. So that lets us know that he is the son of Amittai. Now, the only other time that you see that word Amittai is, the, uh, is back in the Old Testament, and I believe it is in the book of 2 uh, Kings chapter 14, in verse 25, and we're going to look at that verse here in a few moments, but that is the only other time that you see this word Amittai. Now, that's the only thing that we know about him. We know that he was a historical figure. He's mentioned here by Jonah, and likewise, he is mentioned in the book of 2 Kings chapter 14, verses 24 and 25. And so he was an actual figure. But if you look at verse 9, Jonah tells us a little bit more about his lineage or his heritage. Look at verse 9 and look at what he said he was. What does he say? I'm a Hebrew. Now, what does that do for him? Or, or who does that connect him to? Who is the first recognized or identified or the first person identified as a Hebrew in the Old Testament? Who is it? It's Abraham. Let's don't guess. Let's talk about it. I know that you said Abraham. I want you to see it in the Scriptures. Go to Genesis chapter 14 and verse 13. Look at what it says. Genesis chapter 14. And I want you to look at verse uh, 13. All right. Someone read that for me. Now that is the first time in the Old Testament that you and I will see the word Hebrew appear. And who does it relate to? It relates to Abraham, which indicates to you and me he is the first biblical character who is identified or recognized as a Hebrew. Now, when you think about Abraham, you think of individuals like Isaac, his descendants, and you think of individuals like Jacob and Esau, Isaac's descendants. And if you remember Jacob, he went on to become what? What was his name changed to? Israel. Okay, and he had 12 sons. They became the 12 tribes of Israel. And that Hebrew man right there became a Hebrew nation when they went down into the land of Egypt. And when they came out and they conquered the land of Palestine, they became not just Hebrews, but they became the Israelite nation, which is none other than the people of God. So what do we know about uh, Jonah so far? We know that he was a Hebrew. He was a descendant of Abraham, and not only that, but he was one of God's chosen people. And so we know his Lord, we know his lineage, but then also, the Bible teaches us about his land, where he lived or where he was from. Now here's where we want to go over to the book of 2 Kings chapter 14 that we made mention of just a moment ago. And go over there with me. And in the book of 2 Kings chapter 14, uh, verse 25, the Bible states, He restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamath to the sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant, who? Jonah, all right, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from, there we've got a location, don't we? He was from a place known as Gath Hepher. Now, what in the world, or where in the world, was Gath Heifer. As you and I, if we look on a map, we're going to see that Gath Heifer is right there. And my mouse is over the battery is dying. So you can see that it's right there. 
It is blinking. And so, Lee, you might have to go through it. But hold it right there. What I want you to see is I want you to look at a mark, a what we might think of as a landmark. You see Gath Heifer right there with the red dot. Look, if you will, yeah, to the right, and you're going to see the Sea of what? The Sea of Galilee. Okay? Now, I need to go to the next slide. <laughs> He just took the clicker away. <laughs> so, okay. I don't need the clicker if he will click it for me. There we go. All right. Now, what town, what very interesting, recognizable town do you see right there by Geth Heifer? It's Nazareth. What do we know about Nazareth? Huh? Yeah, that's where Jesus grew up, right? Okay, and so that's giving us a key marker as to where Gath Heifer was located. Now, here's the interesting thing that I want you to see about that. And, and you've got to go to the book of John chapter 7 and verse 52 with me in order to see this. But go to John chapter 7 and let's look at verse 52. Go to John chapter 7. Thank you so much. Amen. Uh, John chapter 7 and verse 52. Now, if you remember, if you really start back in verse 45 of John chapter 7, you've got Jesus in a discussion with the chief priests and the Pharisees, okay? These are individuals who should have known the law of God backwards, forwards, sideways, up and down. I mean, even if it snuck up on them, they should have known God's Word. And I want you to drop down in verse 52 and look at what it says. They answered and said to him, speaking to Nicodemus in particular, Are you also from Galilee? Now what's the significance of Galilee? The region of Nazareth is recognizable as the Galilean region. All of that region right there is the region of Galilee because it encompasses or it goes around the Sea of Galilee. So that is the region of Galilee. And he said... Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of what? Liar, liar, pants on fire, right? What does that tell us about these scribes and Pharisees and chief priests? They didn't know the law as well as they thought they did, did they? Because where was Jonah from? He was from the, the region of Galilee. And so I thought it was very interesting as you and I think about his land that it was uh, the, the region where in Jesus went to and he grew up and he lived when uh, while he was here on earth. Now let's take the time to look at the authenticity of this book. And I think this is important because of the very fact that when you think about modern day, what you might think of as scholars or modern day theologians, these are individuals who have PhDs and so forth. When they look at the book of Jonah, they will often look at it as a fable or they will look at it as a fairy tale. Sometimes they will look at it as an allegory or even a parable. Okay, uh, When you think of an unbeliever, an un unbeliever doesn't give this book any credit at all because of the very fact that there is a miraculous event that takes place. You and I believe the book of Jonah with all heart we don't think twice about God creating a fish that could swallow a man and that man could stay alive for three days and then that fish could spit him out because we understand that this is talking about Lord Jehovah. This is talking about the Creator of the world. And if He could create and sustain the world, then folks, could He do exactly what Jonah tells us that He did in this book? Yes. And so you and I don't doubt it. But think about it for a moment. When an individual discredits this one book, you have to think about what they are actually doing. When you and I think about the Bible, we recognize it as a complete oracle given to you and me. We recognize that there is a division between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But we recognize that it is recognized as holy scriptures, whether it's in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. And to deny this book, the book of Jonah, is to deny, the, to deny the entirety of the Bible. And so I think it's important that we stop and we look at the authenticity of this book. Is this a book 
that you and I can trust and we can put our faith and confidence in. I believe it is because number one, of the Jews' acceptance of this particular book. Now go with me, if you will, to the book of Luke chapter 24. Let's go to the book of Luke chapter 24. <clears throat> Luke chapter 24. Someone read verse 44. Luke 24, verse 44. Now, under the Hebrew canon, okay, this would have formed somewhere before what we recognize as the Septuagint. The Septuagint or the LXX, which was a translation from the Hebrew Scriptures to the Greek language, which took place somewhere around 280 B.C. So sometime before 280 B.C., you had a conglomeration of the Old Testament canon that had already been formed. And it was recognized as the law of Moses, number two, the prophets, and number three, the Psalms, or as some would say, the writings. And those three words capsule the entirety of the Old Testament. So at this particular time, when Jesus writes, or when Luke writes, the entire Old Testament canon was recognized, okay? And it was accepted by these people. How do I know that? We're going to see Luke reference Jonah here in just a moment. But when you think about Luke, what's the importance about Luke and his writing? Matthew and Mark and John were all three eyewitnesses to the life of Jesus Christ. Okay? Go back to Luke chapter 1. All right? Go to Luke chapter 1 with me. And as you look at Luke chapter 1, I want you to look at verse 3. Look at what it says. Luke says, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, now watch this, to write an orderly account. Most excellent Theophilus. Luke was not an eyewitness. What he is doing is he is writing an account of the life of Christ that he has gathered from other sources. Now, that doesn't take away from the fact that he was inspired by God. God would not have allowed him to write something that is not or should not be there for you and me, much like the book of Acts. Just as Luke was inspired to write the book of Acts, he was inspired to write the book of Luke. But understand this point. Here's what I want us to see. This was a collection of the thoughts of all of the people or a collection of all of the things that the people had said had gone on. And Luke writes about the account of Jonah. Now, brothers and sisters, by this time, the Old Testament canon had been formed. And the book of Jonah was a part of that Old Testament canon. If this book had been thought of as a myth, or a fairy tale, or just a legend, would they have accepted it? No, they would not. In fact, when they were putting the Old Testament canon together, much like when they put the New Testament canon together, if it was thought of to be a fairy tale or a myth, it was kicked out. You think about the books of the Apocrypha, when you and I think about the Catholic Bible, it includes 14 different books that are recognized as apocryphal books those books are not recognized as being inspired by god why because many of them are based upon myths or legends or fairy tales but the book of jonah did not fall in that category which teaches us clearly that it was an authentic book but not only that i think the greatest the most weighty evidence that you have concerning the book of jonah is that it was accepted by none other than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, in Luke's account, I want you to go there now, Luke chapter 11. Let's go to Luke chapter 11. All right? <clears throat> Luke chapter 11. And I want you to drop down to verse uh, 29. In verse 29, the Bible says, 
And while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, This is an evil generation that seeks a sign, and no sign will be given it except the sign of who? There's Jesus putting his stamp of approval upon who? None other than Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, not only is Jesus putting his stamp of approval upon Jonah, but he is referencing the Ninevite nation as not just a legend or a myth, but rather this was an actual group of people who lived. The Ninevites also, the Son of Man, will be to this generation. Drop down to verse 32. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of who? Of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is there. And you're going to see what Jesus made mention in verse 32 take place in the book of Jonah chapter 3. Jonah's going to go in and say, yet 40 days and Nineveh is going to be overthrown. What do the people do? They repent in sackcloth and ashes. And what does God do? He forgives them. And so in the context of this scripture, You've got Jesus putting his stamp of approval upon the prophet Jonah. Okay? Why did I pick Luke's account? Luke, remember, was an eyewitness. Meaning that what he is gathering together was a common belief that everyone had. Folks, this was not a myth. It wasn't a legend. It was an actual event that took place. Now go to Matthew's account in the book of Matthew chapter 12. Let's go to the book of Matthew chapter 12. And I want you to note there in verses 39, or beginning in verse 38, note what the scripture says. <clears throat> then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet who? There we go again. For as Jonah was, watch this, three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, some translations say whale, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater that Jonah is here. Now Matthew's account is a parallel to what Luke wrote. But here's what I want you to see about Matthew's account. He goes into a little more detail than what Luke does. He focuses on the fact that Jonah was in the, the fish's belly for a period of how long? Three days and three nights. Tell me what he compares it to. His burial, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Okay? Do we believe in the death the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? We do, don't we? Brothers and sisters, Jesus compared His death, burial, and resurrection to Jonah being in the belly of the whale. If we disprove that this book is not real, that it is fake, then what else must we say is not real? Yeah. And everything that you and I are today hinges on the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Corinthian writer would write in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and say, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then our faith is in vain. It's empty. It's worthless. And so to disprove one is to disprove the other. And so I would be willing to say that Jesus is probably the greatest example proving the authenticity of of this book. Let's talk about the recipients of this book. And as you and I think about the recipients of this book, clearly it was to the people of Nineveh. And when you go back to our text, uh, you can see that in the book of Jonah, uh, chapter 1. And uh, someone read verses 1 and 2. All right, rise and go where? To Nineveh and do what? You cry out against it. Now, now John, read uh, chapter 3 and verse 2. Yeah. 
Okay, you got the same message there. The reason you got the same one is because remember the first time God spoke to him, what did Jonah do? You go here, he took the turn and went the other direction. Right opposite of where God told him to go. But when you look at this passage, clearly as you and I see the book of Jonah, the message was directed toward the people there at Nineveh. But I want to suggest and tell you that this book was not designed only for the people of Nineveh. When you look at the, the book, I mean, chapter 3, the message is being given to the people of Nineveh. What about chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 4? I want to suggest then to you that it was toward the people of God who were recognized at that time as Israel. Now, we've got to go back to the passage in 2 Kings again in order to see that, but go back over to the book of 2 Kings chapter 14 and let's read a little bit more other than just verse 25. We read verse 25 a moment ago. Let's back up into verse 23 and begin reading. <clears throat> in verse 23, the Bible says, In the fifteenth year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, the king of Judah, Jeroboam, don't miss that name, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria and reigned for 41 years, okay? Look at what he did in verse 24. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who did what? He made Israel to sin. So you've got this king right here. Jonah prophesied during the time of this king by the name of Jeroboam. This would have been recognized as Jeroboam II, the son, as you note there, of Joash. But note, if you will, that he is reigning just exactly like a man by the name of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Right? What was it that was so wicked and evil about Jeroboam, the son of Nebat? Let's go back to the book of 1 Kings chapter 12, and let's read about this king. What had he done to cause God's people to sin? Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 12 and note, if you will, in verse 25. 1 Kings chapter 12 and verse 25. Then Jeroboam, that's Jeroboam the son of Nebat that we're talking about, that caused God's people to sin. He built Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. Also, he went out from there and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will, watch it, turn back to their Lord. Whoa, put the brakes on. What does that tell us about these people right here? They had turned their backs to the Lord. And Jeroboam is concerned that they're going to turn back to the Lord. All right? That's the kind of leader he was. Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Therefore the king asked advice, made two calves of gold, and said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your what? Gods, O Israel. What's the problem? Violation of the very first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3. But it's not just that. What did he make? The Bible says that he made two calves of what? Calves of gold. And what did he tell the people to do? Look at verse 29. And he set up one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin for the people went to do what? They went to worship. Violation of commandment number two in the biblical list. Thou shalt not make any graven image, nor shalt thou bow down thyself to worship it. God is the only one who is worthy of worship. He broke the first two commands right there. It did stop. Look at verse 31. He made shrines on the high places and made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. What's wrong with that? The only ones who could be priests according to God's law 
and God's decree had to be from the house of Aaron. We could go back to Exodus chapter 28, verses 1 through 4, who happened to be a Levite, and every individual who was a priest or every individual who served in the priesthood had to be related to the Levites. Did he follow that biblical pattern? No. In fact, the Bible says he picked out anybody he wanted, all different kinds of people. In other words, the individuals that would suit his fancy. That's exactly what he did. He even created a feast day. We go back to the book of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. Who was the one who ordained all of the feast day for God's people? It was Jehovah God. He was the one. And so this man is taking the position of God. How did God feel about this? How do you think he felt about it? Well, let's look at chapter 14 and see. Flip over to chapter 14 of 1 Kings and look at verse 14. Moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam. This is the day. What? Even now. For the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water. He will uproot Israel from this good land which he gave to their fathers and will scatter them beyond the river because they have made their wooden images provoking to the, uh, the Lord to anger. And he will give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam who sinned and who made Israel to sin. In other words, God says, I'm going to cut you off the whole house of Jeroboam. Does he follow through with that promise? Go to chapter 15. Go to chapter 15 of 1 Kings, beginning in verse 27. Then Basha, the son of Ahijah of the house of Issachar, conspired against him, and Basha killed him at Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines, while Nadab and all Israel laid siege to Gibbethon, Basha killed him in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned his place. Don't miss verse 29. And it was so when he became king that he killed all the house of who? Jeroboam. He did not leave to Jeroboam anyone that breathed until he had destroyed him according, watch it, according to the word of the Lord which he had spoken by his servant Ahijah the Shilonite, because the sins of Jeroboam, which he had sinned, and by which he made Israel sin, because of his provocation, with which he had provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger. Did God become angry because of what Jeroboam did and the people did? Yes. Now, when you go back to our biblical text, when you look at Second Kings chapter 14, that we were looking at a moment ago, and it said that this Jeroboam, this king under whom Jonah is reigning, remember what he did? He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the man that we just read about. It is my conviction that the book of Jonah is in actuality, or perhaps I could say that Jonah in this book represents the attitude of Israel, God's people. Because number one, what do we see Jonah? Or what kind of attitude do we see Jonah with? Number one, we see an attitude of disobedience. Very first chapter, very first few verses, God says go. What does He do? Oh, He goes. Which way does He go? He goes the opposite direction. He is immediately disobedient right there in the forefront of the passage. What about Israel? Were they disobedient? <laughs> Beyond measure. Not only do you see disobedience, but as you and I continue to look at this book, you see a callous heart. Do you remember in the story, and of course we're going to read it, the, the, the tempests arise and the people are scared to death and they're throwing things overboard and they're calling out to their God. And where is Jonah? Look at chapter 1 and verse 5. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship and lain down and was what? He was sleeping during a storm. How in the world could you do that unless your heart was just completely and utterly calloused? He knew that he had disobeyed God. 
He knew that God wanted him to go to Nineveh and preach. He got on a ship, went the other way, and pillowed his head with not one word. Same thing that a lot of people do today, is it not? How many people do you know whose lives are completely and utterly just engulfed with sin? They're living a complete and utter lifestyle of disobedience to God and they will pillow their head and not think twice about it and be in such a deep sleep that a tornado could come and take the roof off the house and they wake up and wonder what happened. Well, at least it didn't get me. I mean, you would have thought this would have caused him to wake up. But even after they awoke him and they even said to him, what in the world is wrong with you? What do you mean, you sleeper? They were just astonished. That's a calloused heart right there. Was that not the attitude of Israel? So calloused that God had sent prophet after prophet after prophet to them and they wouldn't turn back. But then again, you can see that Jonah had the attitude of an unforgiving spirit. Unforgiving. When God forgave the people of Nineveh, how did Jonah respond? Look at chapter 4 and verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. You know what that word displeased means? It literally means to be broken in pieces. I mean, he was tore completely up. He couldn't stand it. Why? I told you basically in verse 2, I'm summarizing this and paraphrasing. I told you, I knew the moment that I went down there and preached them, they were going to repent. And you're such a good God, such a forgiving God, that you forgave them. I knew that was what was going to happen. I mean, could you imagine that? Someone coming forward and their lives are really just littered with sin. They need to repent. And God's blessed them with that opportunity to repent. And someone gets mad because they went forward. Someone gets mad because they asked for forgiveness of sin. And someone gets mad thinking that we would think that God's going to forgive them. Is that not the attitude of Israel? Yes, and then, and then finally when you think about Jonah, I think you can see an unconcerned individual. How does chapter 4 end? with God's explanation to Jonah as to why He wanted to spare these people. Why did God want to spare the Ninevite nation? Look at verse 11 of chapter 4. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left? What does that mean? They can't discern between their right hand and their left. There's your children. And not just children. We're not talking about smart children. I mean, there, there's a lot of smart children. Little Kara, she could probably tell you some things you didn't know. <laughs> you thought you knew the answer to. But these are babies. And God recognizes the value of human life. Did Israel? No. We get over to the book of Micah. God's going to say, I just wanted you to, to, to love me, to be merciful to people, for you to serve me. And, and you treated my people with, with abuse, with hatred. And, and so they had no concern any whatsoever for, for the people, for humanity. Just like Jonah. Now, Lord willing, next week we will pick up and we will talk about the date of the book and then we will go from there. Uh, you've been a, a great class. I truly enjoyed teaching the class tonight. And uh, Lord willing, we will pick up right there next week. There's going to be a very um, brief intermission. There will be some announcements. And then we will have our evening devotion.
Good evening, everyone. It sure is good to have everyone here. We are thankful to have your presence on this beautiful spring day. And I think it's going to get cool again over the weekend, so just be ready for that. And then it's going to get warm again and cool again. And all those different dogwood winters and blackberry winters and all that, we'll, we'll have those and enjoy them. But for, for now, we're happy to be here on Wednesday night, have a chance to, to serve and honor God with our worship, with our our good Bible class that we just had about the prophet Jonah. And isn't it great to have David Payton back with us? It sure is. Amen. And uh, and we will have a devotional again here shortly. And we're, we're thankful to have that opportunity as well and have some songs uh, and prayer. It's just a, a good day. It's a good day. Uh, we do have some folks on our prayer list and some updates I'd like to share with you. Uh, continue to keep the folks in the Ukraine on your prayers. They got uh, got a lot going on. I can't imagine being in that situation. I don't, I'm sure most of us can't either. Uh, also, an update on Ruth Crow. Uh, she is doing much better, and we are thankful for that. Uh, even though David's back, he's still got a good bit of healing up to do, so we're going to keep on praying for him that he continues to get better and, and gets better and better. Uh, Sylvia Edwards hasn't been feeling well, so please keep her in your prayers. We also want to continue to remember Donnie McClure. Uh, an update on Lamar McCorder. This is Don's brother-in-law. Uh, he's home from the hospital, had some gallstone issues, and uh, going to get some things scheduled for that. So we're thankful that he's doing better. Uh, also mentioned uh, Sunday that Barbara Centel was out. She had a pretty bad fall, and she is going to be healing up from that. So please keep her in your prayers as she heals up from that as well. I did get an update from Brian on on uh, the one-year-old. Uh, Owen McCorder, who was in the hospital, had an allergic reaction to some ear medicine. So uh, we hope that that gets better soon, and and uh, love to love to hear some even better news on that real soon. Also, continue to remember Robin Glaze, who's still having some pain following her back surgery as well, and also uh, Kevin Britton, who's been on our prayer list for a while, uh, who's been diagnosed with cancer, and that's the cousin of Michael Dawson. For our visitors that are here, we'd like for you to fill out a visitor's card if you could. That'll give us a record of your visit. Be sure to hang around and uh, let us get to know you a little bit better. Even if you already know some people here, we still want to sit around and get to know you a little bit better. Uh, don't forget that our fellowship meal will be this coming Sunday, March 27th, following morning worship. After morning worship, we'll have that meal, and then we'll have our afternoon worship at 2 p.m., uh, which, which will uh, make for a nice day with uh, Two spiritual feasts with a physical feast right in the middle. Can't think of anything I like much better. Something that's close, though, is our men's breakfast that we'll have at 8 o'clock on April 2nd, where we'll all meet here and eat. Uh, there's a theme here, and uh, this is why I like announcements so much. I get to talk about eating a lot. So in addition to that men's breakfast, we've got people that need to sign up to eat and sign up to speak. So if you had not signed up for a spot to speak yet, make sure that you do that as soon as you can. Our youth-led worship will be Sunday, April 3rd, so keep that on your calendar. And our door knocking, our next door knocking will be Saturday, April 9th. So make sure that you are taking advantage of these opportunities that we have for each one to reach one. This is a, a good chance to do that. Teen singing will be Sunday, April 10th at Ottawa, following the morning service, so keep that on your calendar. Our next vacation Bible school meeting will be April 17th, so keep that on your calendar as well and plan on 
uh, staying after the evening service on April 17th. Also, as a reminder, Diane will be posting an announcement soon with a day and time of the next CPR training class for April for those who didn't get to, uh, to be there for the first class. There's also information about the Young Ladies' Day at the Subligna Road uh, congregation. That'll be on May 14th. I saved this one for last because I wanted everybody to remember it. Right after services tonight, I need the youth and their parents to meet down front for a short meeting with Lee. Again, right after services, the youth and the parents meet down front uh, for a meeting with Lee. That's all the announcements I have at this time. At the proper time, uh, Randy Overby will have our closing prayer, and Joey's going to lead us in song. Seven seventeen. Seven seventeen. I heard an old story. How Satan came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Good evening. I couldn't think of a more appropriate song. You, you would think that I had, had told him to, to lead that song as it has to do with the atoning and the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ. There's this thing called conversion. We read about it in the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent therefore and get it. Be converted that your sins may be blotted out. So the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. According to that passage, being converted means having one's sins blotted out or removed. 
Well, what does it mean to be converted? In the definition, in the terms of converted, it's convert uh, as a verb. It means to change something into another form, substance, state, or product. It's a transformation. Think of the word convert as to mean change when it comes to a person who adopts a new belief. In the spiritual sense, that's what we're talking about. Conversion in, in, in another sense would be from water into steam. We understand a change takes place. Being converted in the spiritual sense is a change from that one state of being into another state of being. Therefore, from being lost to being saved, unforgiven to forgiven. Many are confused about the conversion and what it means to be converted. The how of it, the when of it. Blood is involved, my friends. Not just any blood, but innocent blood. The innocent blood of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 10 at verse 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats can take away sin. But back in Hebrews in chapter 9 at verse 22, And according to the law, <clears throat> almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood there's no remission. But we're talking about conversion. So let's continue here. Ephesians 1 at verse 7. In Him, that's Jesus Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Jesus' blood effectuates conversion, the change from one state to the other. Matthew 26 at verse 28, Jesus is speaking of the remembrance of himself in the Lord's Supper when he institutes that with the fruit of the vine. He says, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Why? For the remission of sins. His blood was shed for the remission of sins. Sins cannot be remitted without the shedding of blood. And it was Jesus' blood who was, that was shed for the remission of sins. So what does this have to do with being converted? Remember, spiritual conversion is a change, a st change of state from a one being into another, from a lost state into a saved state. So Romans 6 at verse 17 and 18, But God be thanked, that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So here we go. Listen some more in Romans 6 at verse 22 and 23. But now having been, get it, set free from sin, and having been slaves of, become slaves of God, you, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, get it? But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What does that have to do with it? Whatever it was that they obeyed, it set them free from sin, and it gave them eternal life. And that eternal life is in none other than Jesus Christ, the one who bled and died. So what was the form of doctrine? Was it the sinner's prayer to ask Jesus Christ to come into my heart and be Lord of my life? Was it the mourner's bench where I go and try to pray through? Was it praying for baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues? Was it just accepting God's grace for what it is and He's going to save me whether I do anything or not? Was it faith only that I just believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and I am saved and can never lose it. Friends, the truth is, it's none of those. It never was any of those. And it shall never be any of those. If we listen to uh, the inspired Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans 6, verse 3 and following, Or do you not know that as many of us that were baptized into Christ, Jesus was baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. When did newness of life occur? Before or after the burial? Okay, It's after. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly 
we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. When? Before or after the act? After. That the body of sin might be done away, and that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we die with Christ, we believe that also we shall live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, get it, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Baptized into Christ, baptized into his death, where Christ's blood was shed. Jesus said the same thing in, in that his blood was shed for the remission of sins in Matthew 26, 28. Jesus said the same thing again in Mark 16, 15, and 16 when he said to him, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So according to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the gospel that was preached to those Corinthians was the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. In Acts 2.38, Peter preached the same and gave the inspired answer when, he, when they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What did he say? Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of, by the authority of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, according to Scripture, being converted is transitioning from a lost to a saved state, from unforgiven to forgiven. And Scripture confirms the how and when it occurs through repentance and baptism into Jesus Christ. Anything else is but the teaching of men and not of God. And the teaching of men does not bring eternal life, but eternal damnation. Jesus said just prior to his ascension in Luke 24 at verse 46 and 47, Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Conversion in the simplest terms is this. Remission of sins through Jesus' blood. Jesus' blood was shed in his death. We are buried with Jesus through baptism into his death. The blood of Jesus is contacted and applied to the soul in the act of baptism. One goes from the lost state to the saved state. That change occurs. Conversion then will have occurred. To be converted is to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. For in 2 Thessalonians 1, beginning at verse 6, Since it is a righteous, a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, get this, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God, and get this, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Believers, according to God's word, is the obedient. Disbelievers are the disobedient. Who will save you from this crooked generation? Acts 4 at verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name, no other name, no other name, under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. You have heard the gospel. 
if you have not obeyed it, God has given you this day and this opportunity to do so. Won't you do that while you have this day? And if you have stumbled, if you've strayed from God's path, you have the same opportunity to make those corrections and be back in favor with God. Won't you do that as together we stand and sing? certainly good to be here tonight. I believe we can all say that we have been blessed by this opportunity. I want to thank all of those who came out to make this night a, a great success. Uh, all of those who are teachers, and of course you, you can't teach without people who attend. So everyone who showed up helped this to be a great night. Don't forget about our Sunday morning Bible study at 10 a.m., morning worship at 11 and don't forget about the fellowship meal. I can't promise you anything about the preaching, but I can promise you the food will be good. So come and be a part of that. Use it as an evangelistic event. Invite a neighbor, invite a friend, a co-worker, a family member to come and hear the gospel and to enjoy a meal and get to know this good church family. Be a great foot in the door in teaching them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then we'll have a 2 p.m. worship service that afternoon. There are no other announcements. We will be dismissed in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful once again for the opportunity that you have given us to be here tonight. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for all the many blessings of life that you've given us. Heavenly Father, we are just thankful for the church here. We're thankful for the church throughout the world, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for our elders here as they lead us and guide us, Heavenly Father. Just give these men wisdom and the strength to carry on having the truth being taught here. Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with our deacons as they serve. Heavenly Father, just let us do what we can do to help Heavenly Father. And Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for Brother Dave and his ability to preach and teach. And Heavenly Father, we're just thankful that he is back with us, Heavenly Father, for having his surgery. Heavenly Father, we just ask that. You would keep uh, letting him heal, Heavenly Father, so he'll be uh, be able to keep teaching and preaching, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, he's means a lot to this congregation, Heavenly Father, and his family. And Heavenly Father, we also ask that you be with our remaining sick of the congregation that's been mentioned, Heavenly Father. Just be with them and come to them, Heavenly Father, be thy will, and they get their health back and they be out with us once again, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we are uh, thankful for the country that we live in, for the many blessings that 
we have in this country, Heavenly Father. And Heavenly Father, we just ask that the leaders of this country would look to thee for the answer to uh, straighten the country out, Heavenly Father. You know it's in a bad way, Heavenly Father. And Heavenly Father, we ask a prayer upon uh, Ukraine, Heavenly Father, for what the people there are going through, Heavenly Father. We just ask that you would put a hand in that, Heavenly Father, that things would come to an end and may they be peace throughout the world once again, Heavenly Father. And Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful for the church and, and we just ask, Heavenly Father, that you would be with us throughout this week, keep us safe, Heavenly Father, and bring us back uh, Sunday as we'll be here, Heavenly Father. And we just ask, Heavenly Father, that you be with us now and, and just forgive us when we fail you, Heavenly Father. Just in Christ's name.